morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, April 17th, we are turning to another joyful hymn for the season of Easter. Today we are studying hymn number 480 in Lutheran Service Book, He's Risen, He's Risen. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, the Rev. Dr. Brian Ketchelmeyer. Pastor Ketchelmeyer serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Ketchelmeyer, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Oh, it is great to be here. So we get started today. Pastor, talk to us a little bit about the season of Easter, its role within the church year and the life of the Christian. Yeah, no, this is great because, you know, I was thinking about this going into uh, Easter Sunday. You know, what what is the the difference here between Lent and Easter? Lent, of course, is on the focus uh, of Christ, who is a suffering servant, who dies upon the cross. He's the one who atones for our sin. So with his blood that was shed, poured out for us, uh, we have the price paid for our sin. The wage of sin is death, and he pays the price. And so when you're in the season of Lent, you're, you're focusing on Christ crucified. Now, not that we we don't always focus on Christ, because we do. We're always preaching Christ crucified. But in particular, in the season of Lent, we're looking at that suffering and death of Christ taking upon our sin. But what's unique here is that, that that's not the end of the story. I mean, when you look at the Old Testament scriptures and you have the understanding of an animal sacrifice, you have the understanding understanding of an animal dying instead of us, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So throughout the whole Old Testament, every time you have that uh, sacrificial victim uh, that dies instead of us as the innocent one, the blood is shed. This is pointing, of course, to the all-availing sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But what's, what's interesting in the Old Testament is that the animal sacrifice is done again and again and again, right? Um, but the animal never comes back to life. I mean, so it's just, it's the price that has to be paid, but it, it can't be the price that's fully paying the debt that we owe. That's why we need one that is the all of uh, the all availing sacrifice, which is Christ himself. We need a true man who dies in our stead. But the, the whole teaching of the atonement of the death of Christ on the cross, that's not the end of the story. I mean, so it's not just merely about the forgiveness of sins. I mean, so don't get me wrong, of course, it is vitally important that we have the forgiveness of sins, but if all we needed was the forgiveness of sins, then all we would need is a second person of the Holy Trinity to take upon flesh and blood and die in our stead. And then that's the end of the story. He's done it. He's done it. It's accomplished. It's over. It is finished. But, but there's more to the story, and that's Easter. The Easter is this understanding of the resurrection of Christ who has conquered death in the grave. Uh, he's the one who has won the victory for us so that in his resurrection, he gives to us his righteousness. So it's not merely that he has died for our trespasses, but he's also been raised for our righteousness so that in, in the season of Easter, we are proclaiming the, the wonderful teaching of the doctrine of justification, that the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us, counted to us, reckoned as if it were our own by faith. And so that's what we have in Easter is the victory over death and the grave. Uh, we have the bodily resurrection of Christ, which then gives us the hope of that resurrection with him in the end. Uh, death no longer has dominion over him, so therefore death no longer has dominion over us. When we were baptized, we're united into both his death and his resurrection. However, in this life, we continue to sin. In this life, sin continues to cling to us. It continues to remain in us, but it shall not reign over us. So in this life, in our bodies, we've been baptized. And in our bodies, we are waiting for that time when we are put down into the ground. And we have the separation of our body and soul. So that at that time, this is where death is the beginning of life without sin. And the totality of that will not be seen until the resurrection of our bodies, so that when we are raised 
in our bodies on the last day, then no longer will there be sin in our bodies. And so we won't even be able or capable of sinning itself. So this victory that Christ has over the grave, over death, is it's the totality of things being brought together, that we have been reconciled with God, and then we see once again in our own bodies our Redeemer who lives. And so now he stands uh, as one who is living and forgiving until that last day when we no longer need the forgiveness of sins because we no longer have sins, they've all been put away. So th this whole Easter uh, celebration is the victory over death. And it is that anticipation that, that Christ is risen, and so therefore we too shall arise on the last day in the body. So with that wonderful celebration of the season of Easter, Pastor Ketchelmeyer, do you have a favorite Easter hymn? Well, uh, there's a lot. I, I, I really do. I, I do like, <laughs> I do like uh, him 464, that the strife is over, the battle is done. I mean, so I, I like that kind of it's, it's, it's done. We, we, we've won, uh, but not by what we've done, but by what he's done. He's the one who has won. So now the victor's triumph, okay, has begun. I mean, he has won it for us. And so we sing these praises. And so I, I, I love that him is kind of the strife is over it, it, it it's done he, he's did he's done it for us and so i i love that but but i i also love uh, luther's uh, hymn uh, christ jesus lay in death strong bands i, I love that one uh, it, it it is not as as festive as uh LSB 464, the strife is over. That just has more of kind of an upbeat, triumphal, kind sure. of victorious uh, singing. Whereas Luther's a little bit more meditative uh, that we understand Christ Jesus lay in death strong bands. But the idea that death is an old, you know, he's a defeated foe. Uh, that that his brow, the crown is taken off from Luther. It's just, <laughs> it's a different kind of imagery there. Uh, but I also like the old classic uh, German uh, hymn that we have in English in, in him 459, Christ is arisen, uh, that he has arisen for us. And that whole old German hymn is, is from the grave's dark prison. So let our joy rise full and free. Christ our comfort true will be. Uh, that, that's that, that oldest German hymn that, that's known. And that's the, what the, the victory hymn of the Teutonic Knights. And that's also, it's very similar to what Walter's doing in Walter's hymn that we're going to look at here. Because even in that old German hymn where it is Christ is risen, you, you kind of go through these stanzas and in each stanza you end with Lord have mercy and then of course you get into the alleluias alleluias but in in Walter's original hymn each one of his stanzas would have ended with Lord have mercy and, yeah. and so he would have known this as a German I mean this this German hymn that's just ingrained in their heads and and it is just flowing from their mouths throughout the Easter tide uh, that that you have this still Lord have mercy uh, and e even uh, when, when Luther sings his, his hymn uh, of the Lord's Supper, I mean, we're, we're singing, Lord, have mercy. Right. We're always, Lord, have mercy. But the Alleluia, uh, of course, is the typical what we think of in Easter, because that's when we are praising Yah. We're, we're praising the shortened name uh, of, of Yahweh, Yah. We're praising Jesus for what he's done, the victory that he has won. So you've already start, started talking a little bit here about Walther's hymn that we're going to look at today, He's Risen, He's Risen. Any background on Walther? Well, we could spend the whole time talking about that. We don't want to do too much of that. But any background on Walther, the hymn text, history of the hymn before we look at the text itself? Well, what we want to look at here in the history of Walter is Walter is going back to Germany at this point in time when he's reflecting, he he's, uh, has an ailment in his throat, and he's going back to the fatherland, if you will, and he's going to go uh, and interact with fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, family members, uh, medical physicians over there, and he's contemplating uh, this, uh, what we have in Christ. Uh, and so even when he is in the midst of his body, that's kind of falling apart like all of our bodies do. He's looking for that hope of the resurrection of the body. And I can't help but think that there's that direct tie when you go back to Germany and you're back there in Prussia, you know, Saxony, and you're once again singing the song of the Teutonic Knights, the song of victory, the victory over the grave. And so I think that's why there's that very similar, Christ is risen, and so Walter changes to he is risen. 
Christ Jesus, <laughs> you know, he is risen. And so that, uh, again, that refrain, uh, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And so you have Walter going back, uh, contemplating, meditating, uh, and uh, setting his eyes upon the resurrected Christ who defeats uh, death in the grave. Yeah, it, as you're, you're mentioning the Lord have mercy, which is a part of Walter's original German hymn, my understanding, just briefly, is that that Lord have mercy became an alleluia at one point in an English translation until by the time it lands in our hymnal now, that alleluia at the end of the line has been dropped entirely, and we have the text before us today. Right, right, exactly. So when Anna Meyer translates uh, the German of Walther into English in the Lutheran Witness back in 1937, she, she replaces the Lord have mercy with hallelujah, hallelujah, because that, that's the typical uh, Easter... Uh, refrain. Uh, you know, in the season of Lent, we bottle up all of those alleluias, uh, which we get from the Greek, or the hallelujahs, which we get from the, the Hebrew. But we bottle those up and we contain them inside so that we can just open wide and just proclaim the praise of what God has done, the, the songs of the angels. I mean, the songs of the Psalms itself, which is, is praising God, uh, that he has won the victory. The battle is done because of him, not because of us. So that's the typical uh, Easter hymn are just filled with alleluias. I mean, the strife is over the battle. It's one. Right. You, you, you're, you're singing alleluia, 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 uh, praise to uh, Jesus. All right, so let's take a look at Walther's hymn, number 480 in Lutheran service book, He's Risen, He's Risen. Here is stanza one. He's risen, he's risen, Christ Jesus the Lord. He opened death's prison, the incarnate true word. Break forth, hosts of heaven, in jubilant song, and earth, sea, and mountain, their praises prolong. There is stanza one of Walther's hymn. So, Pastor Ketchemeyer, feel free to, to take us into any of these lines. What strikes me is the, the opening of Death's Prison in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the second line, connecting to that German hymn that you were bringing up earlier. Yeah, so again, the, the idea that the old Christ is arisen from grave's dark prison. I mean, so that, that's where he, he has burst free open from the, the, the prison of death. Uh, that, that whole imagery of prison, of course, it's a, a place where you are to be put, uh, you're incarcerated uh, because of a violation, because of uh, some breaking of, of laws. Humanly speaking, we know of the idea of a prison. And so spiritually speaking, the idea of a prison is, is death just kind of encloses us. Death kind of swallows us up. Uh, death has us. It has us in its grips. But then the, the idea of a prison being open, uh, flung open. Uh, of course, we, we get that language in First Peter chapter three, where 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 you have a Peter proclaiming Christ crucified, and then of course Christ is raised, and this is in chapter three where he's also talking about the, the tie-in with baptism, because in baptism we are united into the death and the resurrection of Christ, not just the death of Christ, but also the resurrection. So it's in chapter three where Peter says baptism now saves. Remember back in the days of Noah, uh, you had eight who were saved by water. But this is where, where Peter says that Christ suffered for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. I mean, that's the whole point of the atonement, that he brings reconciliation with God by being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. I mean, so that's the idea here of a prison. You get that imagery with Peter that Christ goes to the place of the dead. He goes to the place of Hades to proclaim victory. It's a victory dance. It's a celebration. It's not a, it's not a second chance. So we, we want to be clear on that. But it, it, he goes in and he just, he, he says, I have the victory so that this prison cannot close us up. The, the doors of the prison cannot be sealed because he's burst them wide open. I mean, that's the imagery that we have here. And so when you talk about him being risen, uh, it's the, the prison it is, is now it's done. It can't contain us. It can't refrain us, just like the tomb and the grave could not contain or refrain him. And that, that language that we also have that Walter wants us to understand is the incarnation, because this is what's so significant. It, it's not just that God has wiped the slate clean and said, okay, your sins are forgiven. I'm just going to count it as if you didn't do it. The God himself actually had to take flesh and blood. Uh, the reason why he has to take flesh and blood is so that he can suffer and die in our stead. 
I mean, so this is the incarnate word. He's the one who has to suffer. He's the one who has to take upon our sin. And then he's the one who has to die. So he dies the death that we deserve. But then he has victory over that death. He has victory over that grave. And so that's why when we were singing the incarnation, is that God takes upon our sin, puts it into the grave, and then he comes out of the grave completely righteous. I mean, it's the vindication. It's the overturning of the judgment of the high priest on earth, which which uh, proclaims Jesus as blasphemous. And then you hang Jesus on the tree, and that's very intentional because then he's accursed. And so they're using this as a, a proof positive that he can't be the Messiah. So he's dead. He's done. It's all over. But then this victory uh, is one when now that that tomb is empty. And, and so the tomb is empty. It's an overturning of the ruling of what the high priest said here on earth, that he is raised for our righteousness in his body. And so this is the whole point of the bodily resurrection. What we lost in Adam and Eve, what we have inherited in uh, their sin, that original sin, the origin of sin goes back to them when we were conceived and when we were born, we have a body that's inflicted, inflicted and infected with, with sin. But now in the incarnation, you have the true man. You have the true body that is not uh, infected with sin. And so death doesn't have dominion over his body, and therefore it shall not have dominion over our bodies. So that's this. It's not just this idea of like Greek or pagan or philosophical thought that you're trying to escape the body and the real you is the spirit you. And so you want to just, the body's the prison. The body's not the prison. Death itself is the prison. Uh, death is what's containing us, uh, refraining us from, from having life. And so when Jesus overcomes in his body, then then we have the hope of the bodily resurrection itself. And therefore, you have a renewal and a restoration of creation. So this is why Walter then goes immediately into this, the host of heaven will break out into song. The earth, the sea, and the mountains will all burst out of song because now creation was anticipating this. I mean, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, that, that moaning, that groaning of creation, waiting for the revealing of the adoption of the sons of God uh, that, that is in the bodily resurrection. They're waiting for that hope to see this. And now you see this in Jesus, who is the firstborn of the dead. So now creation itself starts singing the, this victory song. And that's the whole hallelujah, where we go to like Psalms uh, 148, 149, 150, and that whole range. But in particular, in Psalm 148, this is where you have hallelujah, praise to Yah. And who's going to praise Yah? Well, the heavens, the heavens are going to praise him. They're going to praise him in the heights. The angels, the angelic host are going to praise him. All of his hosts, the sun and the moon are going to praise him. The shining stars, the highest heavens and the waters above the heavens. I mean, this is Psalm 148. And why? Because in Psalm 148, because he has raised up for his people, uh, what? What is he raised up? A horn a horn of salvation. I mean, so this is this whole, the resurrection of raising up, of standing up one who has defeated death in the grave. And so all of creation then joins in this victory song because all of creation was put into this subjection uh, of, of this, uh, the sorrow and the sadness of sin. Yeah, the, the creation breaks forth here and stands a one, and we join in that. I mean, obviously, we're breaking forth into the praises here already, but really in verse 5 is where that we are commanded and, and invited to really join into this creation praising, the heavenly host praising already here in stanza 1 because of what the incarnate true word has done. I appreciate what you said about that phrase there, because I think it then connects us into stanza 2, where he's called the Lord of creation. You remember St. John in his prologue talks about the word becoming flesh, and nothing was created apart from him. So it is this incarnate true word who is the Lord of creation, who has come to win our salvation in death and resurrection. So stanza one, he's risen, he's risen. The praises are breaking forth in all creation and in the heavenly host. Stanza two tells us more of the story and starts talking about what happened on Good Friday. Here's stanza two. The foe was triumphant when on Calvary, the Lord of creation was nailed to the tree. 
In Satan's domain did the hosts shout and jeer, for Jesus was slain whom the evil ones fear. There is stanza two of Walther's hymn. So, Pastor Ketchemeyer, this this second stanza, the way it starts, has always made me, it's given me pause, because on the one hand, it seems, I suppose, natural to look at Good Friday and see it as, a, you know, the foe was triumphant. On the other hand, Jesus talks about Good Friday as part of his glory. So help us to, to hold those two things together, that the foe's triumphant, and yet Good Friday is also not a, a defeat for Jesus. Help, help us to hold those things together. Yeah, uh, well, uh, very good. So in, in that first stanza, I mean, we're talking about the fact that he's risen, okay? But now we're kind of, we're going backwards a little bit, all right? So we're going backwards to, as you said, you know, Good Friday, Golgotha, uh, Calvary, and when he's hanging on the tree. And, and so it is at that point, what it looks like is it looks like defeat. I mean, so this is the whole idea. Remember, the, the Jews are mocking him because he says he's the Messiah. And they're mocking him and saying, oh, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They say, oh, look, he's calling for Elijah. He needs help. Let's see if Elijah hears him. Let's see if God hears him. I mean, this whole mocking of him being the Messiah. And then, of course, the Gentiles are mocking him as being a king. I mean, this, he claims to be the king of the Jews, but look, what kind of a king is just hanging on a tree? So this is why that Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews. Because for the, the Jews, they, they think that this is proof positive that he's not the Messiah. Because in, in Psalm 89, the understanding of the son of David, the Messiah, is he's going to live forever. And so when they hang him on the tree for the high priest, this is proof that he is cursed, because cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. And it's just showing to everybody by the high priest's declaration that this is not the Messiah, because the Messiah does not die. The Messiah, Messiah lives forever. And, and so the, the Jews, the religious leaders, the, uh, the high priest, all the priests, they're saying, look, we have the victory. We are right, and he was wrong this whole entire time. And, and the Romans in the same way are, are saying, look, we have the victory. This is not really a king. I mean, so yes, he made this claim to Pontius Pilate that Pontius Pilate wouldn't have any authority unless it was given to him from on high, uh, that his angels could come and rescue him if he wanted. But look, it's not happening. So where's his legion of angels? Where's his heavenly host? Where are all of these, uh, the, the soldiers that are going to come and uprise and, 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 and overthrow the Roman kingdom? I mean, so you also have the Romans looking at this saying, look, he's a king. There's a crown of thorns on his head. That's the kind of king he is. And so it's a stumbling block. It, it, it's foolishness to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. It makes no sense. Why would you say that your king is mighty and strong? That, that can't be mighty and strong. This is weak. Uh, th this is, is defeat. Uh, and, and you have, the, of course, the, the title over his head that this is uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And it's the Romans are saying, look, that, that's a king. That's the Jewish king. A Jewish king is feeble compared to a Roman king. A Jewish king can do nothing. So, I mean, that's, that's the whole appearance on earth of what's going on. And so what Walter is doing here is peeling back not only that, that visible physical reality at the crucifixion itself, but pulling back the curtain and saying, this is exactly what was going on in the dark realm of the evil foe. OK, the evil spirits, because they're the one who are kind of egging everybody on, jeering everybody on. This is the whole idea that where Jesus is tempted from the cross, saying, if you are the Messiah, come down from the cross. I mean, that goes back to the temptation uh, of the uh, uh, when Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness. You know, throw yourself down and your heel's not going to be uh, wounded at all. But so you have the devil saying, hey, look, we have the victory. It, 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 he's, he can't be the Messiah, okay? Because cursed is he who's on the tree. And, and that's why you have later on when Paul is addressing the baptized in Corinth, like in chapter 12, and he's addressing this issue of these Gentile converts that he, he says in chapter 12 that nobody can say that Jesus is accursed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, you can't say that. So in the synagogue where they're saying he's cursed, that, that's not of the Holy Spirit. Yes, they have the scriptures, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. And nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us eyes to see what is taking place here, uh, what is going on on 
the tree at Calvary. And so the foe thinks he's triumphant, the Lord of creation being nailed to the tree. So in Satan's domain, the his host, his armies are shouting and jeering because they say, look, Jesus was slain. Okay, that's the one we feared, but it's it's all done. It's finished. It's over. We don't have to worry about him anymore. Okay, we've won the victory, so much so for the, the Messiah. And that that's, you know, think about the message too, when when the, the apostles are going out and proclaiming the message of Christ crucified, okay, we definitely preach Christ crucified because without the shedding of his blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of his blood, there is no payment price and reconciliation with the Father. But it, that's half of the message in the sense that when Peter says, like in Acts chapter uh chapter 10, when Peter is proclaiming and saying, hey, we're all witnesses of what took place here in the country, in the city of Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. I mean, so we've all seen this. We've all seen what took place and what happened. And it appears to those who are gathered that uh, that is the end. Remember, only John uh, of the 12 is standing at the base uh, of the cross. The rest are in fear because they said, I, I guess we were wrong. This wasn't the Messiah. They're confused on the whole thing because the Messiah is supposed to live forever. So if you just have the message that we all saw it, we know it, he was hanging on the tree, and that's the end of the story, it does seem like the devil has the victory. But that's not the end of the story. That's the whole that's right. point of the resurrection, that these eyewitnesses, they saw the empty tomb. They saw the resurrected body. So that's why it's this whole idea of the next stanza is short lived was their triumph, all right? Because yeah. this is what Peter is doing in Acts chapter 10, where he says, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But, <laughs> but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, okay, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with them after he rose from the dead. So at that time of the crucifixion, it looks like uh, the victory was won by the devil. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. But it's the whole issue of the empty tomb. The body's not there. It's a bodiless tomb. But it's the proclamation. It's not just the body's not there and nobody knows where it is. The the witnesses, the eyewitnesses testified that they saw Jesus resurrected from the grave. I mean, so that's going to be the big but in verse 3, but short was their triumph. That's right. So we will pick up stanza 3 on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Brian Ketchelmeyer this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that an investment with Lutheran Church Extension Fund exclusively supports LCMS ministries and church workers? That's right. LCEF ensures LCMS churches, schools, and organizations have access to the financial resources they need to sustain, strengthen, and start ministry work. In other words, you can feel good investing with LCEF because we share your Lutheran values and love for the church. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, April 17th. We're studying hymn number 480 in Lutheran service book, He's Risen, He's Risen. Our guest today is the Reverend Dr. Brian Ketchelmeyer. He serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Ketchelmeyer, prior to the break, you were telling us about stanza two, in which we take a look at Good Friday. It looks as if the devil has won. His hosts in hell are cheering because of the death of Jesus, standing in contrast to the ongoing praise. That's a short-lived praise that's happening in hell by Satan's domain. Here we're going to go into the ongoing praise of the Lord Jesus Christ for his 
eternal victory. So we turn to stanza three. This is a, a good example, just as an aside, Pastor Ketchermeyer, of needing to be careful of selecting only certain hymn stanzas. This is not a good one to turn to and say, hey, let's just sing the first two. You got to sing stanza three as well. So here we go. Stanza three. But short was their triumph, the Savior arose, and death, hell, and Satan he vanquished his foes. The conquering Lord lifts his banner on high. He lives, yes, he lives, and will never more die. There is stanza three of Walther's hymn. So again, we have the, the but here, a key word in stanza three. The devil's seeming triumph is short. Christ rises, and now the victory is complete and obvious to all. Take us into this stanza. Well, again, when we see Christ hanging on the tree, uh, natural knowledge would tell you that this was a common criminal and that uh, he's died because he claimed to be a king and he wasn't a king. And so he's dead. It's over. So that's natural knowledge. So natural knowledge just thinks, well, okay, I guess we move on to the next big thing. But it's the revealed knowledge that understands that when he was put into the tomb, that that's rest. Now, now, remember and recall with me, this is three days later, you know, on the third day, okay? So it, it's not an immediate, he dies and then he, he, all of a sudden he wakes back up and says, nope, just kidding, I'm not dead. But instead, you're waiting the three days, okay? Just like Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be. And so you're waiting and anticipating and saying, well, it seems like it's defeat. It seems like uh, there is no victory. But that's why Easter Sunday, when in the morning, the tomb is empty. And, and go back to, to Peter again. He, he's proclaiming and he's preaching in Acts chapter 10, both Christ crucified, which everybody saw, but also Christ raised from the dead, which the eyewitnesses saw. They ate and they drank with him. And so when Peter is writing his first epistle in chapter 2, when he talks about the crucifixion of Christ, I, I think that this is also, it, it appears like the, the devil is one. I mean, we, we talk about those, those last seven words of Christ on the cross. And in what, what Peter is trying to bring to our attention in chapter 2 of his epistle, that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. I mean, so it is interesting because, so on the cross, Jesus is not arguing with the priests. He's not arguing with uh, the government, the Gentiles, and saying, no, I really am the Messiah. No, no, I, I really am the Christ. He, he's silent in that sense. He is suffering, and he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And so it, it does appear, because he, he's not making a, a case for why, hey, you guys got to take me off of the, the cross. I really am the Messiah. You're wrong. And so it appears that, well, okay, he's silently suffering. Uh, he, you know, he says uh, that, uh, I, I thirst. It is finished. Into your hands I commend my, my spirit. It, so it just, it, it, it looks like it's all game over. So this is where uh, Peter will say that, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Again, it's on the tree, that's where our sin is. And so that's where you see your Savior, but you also see your sin. And, and that's that, you, you're asking the question about kind of the cross, is this Jesus being exalted? Is this Jesus being humiliated? On the cross, know that you see these two things colliding. You see your sin. <laughs> the one who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So he, he has no sin, but you see your sin. You see the, the ugliness of sin, the brutality of sin, and what is done because of sin, that separation from God. But at the same time, you also see your Savior. So you see the one who suffers in your stead. So uh, what, what Peter is saying is he himself bore our sins on the tree so that he might die to sins and live to righteousness by whose wounds you have been healed. And so, of course, what Peter is doing is he's going back to Isaiah 53, that he is the lamb who is silent. Okay, he's the one who is suffering, the suffering servant. Uh, we esteemed him not. You know, he's stricken, smitten, afflicted by God. And so it looks like he's accursed. But yet we know because of the revealed knowledge of salvation that he's the one who 
suffered for us and by his wounds we are healed. That's Isaiah 53, that he's the lamb who bears our sin. So he bears it for us. And that's really the difference between a reflection on what took place there and the proclamation of the purpose of why it was done. Why did he die on the cross? He died for you and for me. Why did he rise again from the dead? For you and for me. So he lives, he lives, and will never more die. Uh, That death has no dominion over him, and in Christ we are a new creation. There is no condemnation, and death cannot have dominion over us. And so this idea of conquering, the conquering with the banner on high, I mean, that that goes back to the old image and the artwork, even at the time of Luther, where you have Christ coming out of the tomb with that victory banner, the flag of victory. Now he's like, staking the the flag in the ground saying, I won. This now is mine. It belongs to me. And and so you see all those pictures, even with uh, Lucas Cronach, uh, of Christ coming out of the grave with one foot on death, a skeleton, and the other foot on the devil, uh, which is this kind of foul creature, this demonic thing. Thing, and his feet are on both. They're defeated, and he's waving the flag of victory, not the flag of defeat. But that flag is a white flag, a white banner with a red cross because of the red blood of Christ. So it's in his death that he has won the victory over death and the grave, and he shows us this, that it is finished, by showing us that he is now outside of that tomb. He's not contained in it. So you have that resurrection uh, of Christ, the victory of Christ, and so that's that classic understanding of the banner. We, we also see that image with a lamb. Uh, the, we, we as Lutherans are very fond of that lamb because we say, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He bears the sin of the world, but he's the lamb who was slain. So he's standing. So he's not a lamb who is just laying there dead, but a lamb who has won the victory. And so we have that image over and over again in our iconography of a lamb and the blood is, is pouring forth from a living lamb who has life-giving, uh, sanctifying blood in his, his flesh, his body that he gives to us to eat and to drink that we would have life in ourselves. So he stands as one who has, has won the victory, not as one who is defeated. So this is the whole, now death and hell are vanquished, okay? That, that whole, uh, they have been defeated. And so that, that death and hell and, and Satan himself. And so again, in the, like the Lucas Cronach painting that we see a lot of that, that distinction between the law and the promise on the side of the promise is the grave is open. It's empty, whereas usually on the side of the law, the grave has a body in it still. <laughs> it's, it's death, you know, or you have uh, death and the devil kind of prodding on humanity into the grave. But in Lucas Cronach's imagery, the iconography of Christ standing, the grave is open. It, it, it's open. The door's not shut anymore. Uh, it's not going to contain us. It, it's blown open so that we can see that the body is not there. He lives and he forgives. So when we say that he lives, he lives, we're saying he forgives, he forgives. He's living and forgiving, which of course for us as Lutherans, ever since the day of Luther, that image of the Lamb, that's the focal point that we want to see. That's who Christ is. We don't want to see Christ as the angry judge that's going to come uh, and you stand before him right now and you have no hope, so you have to look to one of the saints instead to be your mediator between you and Jesus, who's angry because you're a sinner. Instead, you see that Jesus is the mediator, the one mediator between man and God. He's the one that stands in our stead. He stands for us before the Father so that we would know that we are right in God's sight because of what Jesus has done. Mm, yeah, and, and because he lives and will never more die, he is our eternal advocate before the Father, our eternal intercessor, mediator, who pleads our case. And as you said, he lives, he forgives. So we get more of that effect of what this resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ means for us, beginning in stanza four. So we've got the the praising of all creation that happens by the whole creation praises the Lord Jesus for his resurrection in stanza one. We have the recounting of Good Friday and Easter in stanzas two and three. Now in stanza four, we hear more of the effect of what this means for us. Oh, where is your sting, death? We fear you no more. Christ rose, and now open is fair Eden's door. For all our transgressions, his blood does atone. Redeemed and forgiven, we now are his own. There is stanza four of our hymn. 
It's pretty bold here in stanza four, Pastor Ketchelmeyer. We actually taunt death. Where you? It says we're actually speaking to death here. Where is your sting, death? We're not afraid of you. Uh, take us into this this bold stanza. Yeah, so the, this bold stanza, of course, is rooted in the Old Testament scripture in Hosea chapter 13, that that's the promise that we have. So Yahweh himself makes the promise that I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. This is the place of the dead. I shall redeem them from death. So he's the one who's going to do this. He's the one that's going to have victory. The grave, death, Sheol, Hades is not going to win. I mean, natural knowledge at the day of the crucifixion looks like uh, death is won. It looks like it, it, the battle is done and, and death is the victor. But it's this, the, you know, the, this whole fight that's going on between death and the one who is life. And the idea of, of death swallowing us up, but then he swallows up death. I mean, so this is the imagery that we have. But he's going to redeem. He's going to ransom. And then that's the taunting. Okay, as a victor, you're taunting and saying, okay, death, where are your plagues? Uh, oh, death or Sheol, where is your sting? And then what Hosea has, though, is very intriguing. Is, is Hosea the prophet says, but compassion is hidden from my eyes. Because what we have a natural knowledge in our experience is uh, sorrow and sadness and sickness, uh, death and destruction. I mean, we, we see these things in creation. We know the promise, but it, the promise is contrary to our experience. So when we put somebody into the grave, what we see is that body is going into the grave and you see a finality. You, you, put the, you close the coffin, you, you, you put dirt on top of, uh, of the, the body, and now the, you're in a cemetery and they're just laying there. So you, you, you don't see the victory. You don't see it. And so the compassion is hidden from my eyes. You can't see it. But it's the revealed knowledge, the, the assurance that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And so we need to hear that assurance again and again and again to know that he stands. He stands for us with the Father. He is living and he is forgiving. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul is saying, hey, if, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, I mean, we should be pitied uh, amongst all people. Why do we even bother to gather? Why do we even bother to do this Christian thing? I mean, because by, by natural appearance, it doesn't seem like Christians have the victory. It doesn't seem like it. E even the, the question is, well, well, did we miss this resurrection of the body? Because we keep putting bodies into the grave and nothing's happening. But th this is where uh, Paul, I, I, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians that that is the gospel message, that Christ has conquered death. That he is the one who is the victor over death and the grave. And this is the hope that we have, this hope of eternal life and the bodily resurrection. And so that's when Paul has to go through this whole kind of uh, litany of when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Because remember back in Hosea, it's this compassion is hidden from my eyes. I don't see it now. I don't see it now. But we have eyes of faith. We do not walk by sight. We have ears that hear and ears that see the promise. We have hearts that see, that are enlightened by the Holy Spirit with this promise over and over again. But it's at that point at the resurrection of the body, then we will see it with our own eyes. I mean, this is, uh, of course, Job in Job chapter 9. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I'm going to see him with my own eyes. I'm going to see him with my own eyes on the last day in the resurrection of the body. But in the meantime, we know the song. Oh, death, you've been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Because we know the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but Christ has fulfilled the law in our stead. He has done everything that is, is required of us, and he has refrained from everything that is forbidden for us. Again, he's the one who had no sin, but yet for our sake, he took upon our sin in his body. And in him, we have the righteousness of, cross, of Christ. So that's why we can say, uh, but thanks be to God, he's the one that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have victory. So we can go around and we can say, we have victory, hallelujah, over the enemy. We have victory, hallelujah, over death and the grave. We have victory, hallelujah, over Satan. And so Satan might have thought he won, or Satan continues to pretend like he won. And I think that's really the spiritual battle that we have now, is Satan is the one who's always putting the doubt in our minds. Did God really say that? Is this really true? So when you go back to Eden, remember, that was the issue. 
where God made, uh, gave Adam the word, and he made this threat that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And then the Satan comes in, the serpent, the old evil foe, and he slithers in and he says, no, 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 that's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. Did God really say that? He's the one who's always putting a doubt. But Eden's door is open again. I mean, so remember, when Adam and Eve were expelled out of the garden, that, that whole picture is how the garden was, how creation was before the fall into sin. And so we're waiting for the restoration, and it can only be found in the incarnation. So that's the imagery that we have in the book of Revelation, where we have this new heavens and this new earth that, of course, Isaiah talks about in chapter 65 and 66. And we're looking of the this earth of Eden, of paradise once again. And so you have the assurance right now in the blood of Christ. His blood has atoned for sin, for our transgressions. He is the one who has redeemed us. Just like uh, Hosea says, I will ransom, I will redeem. And so therefore we are his own. We belong to him. I mean, so a lot of this is just packed into the, that one stanza. Absolutely. And you can see how in this stanza, you, you do not leave behind the death of Christ. You have his blood that atones for our sins and our transgressions here, so that the, the crucified one and the risen one are one and the same, our Lord and Redeemer, who has won forgiveness and atonement for us by both his death and his resurrection. It's a marvelous stanza that helps us to proclaim the good news of Easter and what it means for us, that now Eden is open to us. The restoration of creation is coming. The incarnate true word comes back into play, as you mentioned in stanza one. Here we see just what that means for us. And we are his own, the same language that Luther uses in his explanation to the second article of the Creed. This is why Christ has redeemed us, that we may be his own and live under him in his kingdom. So, stanza five then, we join in the praises that have been resounding throughout this hymn with a doxological close. Here is stanza five. Then sing your hosannas and raise your glad voice. Proclaim the blessed tidings that all may rejoice. Laud, honor, and praise to the Lamb that was slain. With Father and Spirit, he ever shall reign. There is stanza five of Walter's hymn, He's Risen, He's Risen. So, Pastor Ketchelmeyer, you, you said at length that the word Alleluia is often associated with the season of Easter. Here we also have the word Hosanna, which we think of especially with Palm Sunday, but now even on Easter we continue to sing our Hosannas. Help us into the praises of stanza five. No, thank you for bringing that to our attention, because again, when you're looking at Scripture and you're meditating upon the truths of God's Word, or as you're reflecting on it in hymns, like, like this hymn right here, a hymn of praise, uh, again, a hymn of praise is always proclaiming what God has done, the personal work of Christ in the Son in particular, uh, defeating death for us. And so you would expect, so when you're looking at something and you're going to reflect and meditate, Think about what you would expect. You would expect to say, so then sing your hallelujahs. <laughs> sing your hallelujahs now. Now sing your hallelujahs. But I, I think what, what's fascinating here is you're going back to Palm Sunday. So Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday, where it's like, this is the one. This is the Messiah. This is the son. This is the son of David. And you say, Hoshiana, you know, save us, please. Save us now. Save us, we beseech you. And so you're proclaiming that. And it was this rejoicing and the celebration that we have the Messiah, and he's come to give us victory. And that's, remember, the, the high priest and the leaders are saying, hey, uh, keep your disciples quiet. Listen to what they're saying. You know, and it's like, well, even the rocks would cry out because, again, it's all creation is going to cry out. So you're going back to Palm Sunday, in essence, and you're proclaiming with all creation that this is the one that we've been waiting for. This is the sun. So this is the hosannas. Now, remember that also every Sunday is an Easter Sunday, but every Sunday is also a Palm Sunday because every Sunday in the liturgy, after the words, or I should say, I'm not after, but right before the word, uh, words of institution, when we are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We're going back to Palm Sunday, and we're saying, Hosanna, 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 you know, save us now, please, because we know that he humbly comes to us now in time, okay? He comes to us in the bread and the wine, 
body and blood to assure us of his victory over death in the grave. His flesh is life-giving, his, his blood is sanctifying, and so he comes to give us this because he stands as the mediator. And this is what we're doing when we go into the book of Revelation, which is really a sermon on the ascension. Christ has died, he has risen, and he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. He now stands as high priest. So he has the, this, this office of high priest. He's the lamb that was slain, but he's the lamb that reigns. And so he reigns in victory over death and the grave. And in this life, we still need the forgiveness of sins. So in this life, in our own bodies, we're still plagued with sin. And so he, we continue to claim, proclaim, Lord, have mercy. We, we continue to proclaim, save us now, save us from our sin in our own body within. And we're waiting for the resurrection of the body. And again, this is the key about the incarnation. In the Lord's Supper, he gives to us his body and his blood to eat and to drink here in time now. Uh, this is not a symbol uh, of nothingness. This is the reality of the incarnation, that he comes to restore us in creation. And so we're proclaiming what the Lamb has done. He has, he's the one who bears our sin. He's the one who's conquered death in the grave. And he's the one who continues to shepherd us as the Lamb. He's the good shepherd that laid down his life for the sheep, and he took it up again. But he's also the Lamb. He's the victim. He's the sacrificial Lamb. Yeah, so the proclaim the blessed tidings that all may rejoice. Notice how the the it keeps expanding. So again, we had all creation, all of heaven joining in this praise of the risen Lord. Now we're invited to sing our hosannas and as we as we proclaim these blessed tidings, as we praise him, as you said by proclaiming what he's done, not just by by saying, "Hey, you're so great, Jesus," by actually proclaiming this is what the Lord Jesus has done, now all may rejoice. So this this singing of the Lord's praises is a proclaiming of his victory so that others would be brought to faith in the salvation that he's won. Yeah, so that, that proclamation, remember, again, when we, in the liturgy, we gather around the word and the sacraments. Uh, you, you have the sacrament at the altar given to us, and we say, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we proclaim that he has atoned for our sin. We have the assurance that he's paid the price. And in that also, we have the assurance that he's been raised from the dead. And so we are, we are proclaiming his death that in the death we have the payment for our sin, but we are also proclaiming that he's going to come again because he is no longer dead. He lives forever. He reigns as high priest, as king, and he will return. And he will return to judge the living and the dead. I mean, we confess this in the creed, but not today. Not today, not now. Now he is our mediator. Now is the day of salvation. So that's the proclamation. It's today. Today is the salvation. The lamb was slain for us. The lamb reigns for us. And so you're inviting others to join in with the joy that's only found in Jesus. So the liturgy itself is where we on earth, the whole purpose of the church on earth is to forgive sins, to proclaim the person and work of Christ. And when we gather as the saints, the, the believers, in Christ, those who have been baptized into Christ, reunited in his death and resurrection, we sing the praise of Christ, which praise also includes his crucifixion. Okay, so his crucifixion is praise music because it's praising what he has done, what he has accomplished for us, what he has won. And so we have this victory in him, but you, this laud and honor and praise to the land that was slain, uh, that we are proclaiming these blessed tidings that all may rejoice. So when we gather in this veil of sorrow and sadness here on earth in this life, waiting in anticipation for the new creation, uh, we get off the rails sometimes and we, we get stuck in the sadness and the sorrow and we, we don't lift our eyes up to the Lord. So when we gather again, we hear it, that we have joy in Jesus, that we would want others to rejoice with us to rejoice in him. Yeah, and so we join in this laud, honor, and praise to the Lamb that was slain with Father and Spirit, he ever shall reign. Praise to the Holy Trinity for what he has done for our salvation through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Reverend Dr. Brian Ketchelmeyer serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. He's been helping us today to study hymn number 480 in Lutheran service book, He's Risen, He's Risen. Pastor Ketchelmeyer, thanks for being our guest today. 
Oh, it was my pleasure. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this hymn or you'd like to let us know what your favorite hymn for the season of Easter is, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.